All right, thank you everyone for joining us. We're able to, to say hello to a few folks who were here earlier, but we appreciate your time. Um, we appreciate you joining tonight's session, Programming with Rust, with speaker Dinesh Farahari. Uh, my name is Carrie Williams. I'm the Communications and Information Officer here at Extension, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jim Kosteka. Jim is our Program Manager for the Engineering and Technology Department. Dinesh, do you mind going to the um, agenda slide just so we can take a quick look? <laughs> okay, thanks. So we're planning on about 45 minutes tonight and we do have a lot we're excited to share. And of course we wanna leave time to get to your questions. So we're gonna take a quick look at the agenda. You have a sense of what to expect tonight. Um, we'll do intros. We're gonna talk about the history of Rust and how Rust compares to other programming lam languages. We'll take a look at benchmarking data. Um, and if time allows, we'll try to run some sample code. And of course then we're happy to open the session up to your questions. Um, we do have a few very quick housekeeping items, and then I'll officially hand things over to Dinesh. Um, once we kick things off, if you wouldn't mind adding your questions to the Q&A, um, Jim and I will do our best to either answer them on the spot, or we'll save them for the end of the session and, and make sure Dinesh, Dinesh has a chance to take a look at them. If for whatever reason we're not able to get to your questions tonight, or if you think of something later, you can always email us at extension at ucsc.edu, and we'll go ahead and put that in the chat for you. Um, and we are recording tonight's session, so be on the lookout for our follow-up message in the coming days with a link to that recording. So with that, let me introduce our speaker. Leading us tonight is Dinesh Farahari. Dinesh is a Python instructor here at Extension. He comes to us tonight with over 20 years of experience in, software develop in the software development industry, so we are in, we are in expert hands tonight. Uh, Dinesh, the floor is officially yours. Uh, thank you, Kerry and Jim. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending the session. Uh, I know it's late uh, after work day, so everybody's probably tired and wants to go eat dinner and other things. Uh, so it's uh, greatly appreciated that you have taken precious time, uh, personal time to attend the class. Hopefully it, it it's of use and value to you. Okay. Uh, this is me and uh, the highlights that Kerry uh, mentioned. Uh, uh, but again, uh, we won't worry about any of these. There's not much of a data in there. But like most of you, I started as an individual software engineer many, many years ago uh, doing Unix kernel work. And one thing led to another and another and another. And I ended up uh, in different big and small companies. And uh, I've been teaching at UC Extension now for about two years uh, or more even, uh, I believe uh, 2020, uh, when COVID started, I started teaching in here. And what I teach is Python for programmers. All right, so um, this first slide is something that might help you to get a better feel where Rust came from and how many years it has been around and so on and so forth, just in case. Uh, so it started in 2006 as, as a personal project by a Mozilla org engineer by the name of Graydon. And that was his own personal thing that he did. Graydon uh, expertise shows, uh, or projects that he has worked on are mainly compilers like GCC and others. So he was working on this uh, and on Rust, uh, being frustrated by, by the memory safety issues that C++ has. And I guess one thing led to another, he tried to create a language to address those frustrations that he had. And that was beginning of uh, Rust. Then uh, at one point in 2009, Mozilla.org, decided to sponsor the project, put effort and engineering uh, person hours in it. And the first release was done in 2015. So uh, as you can tell, uh, this language is relatively a young language. Uh, C++ has been around forever. Uh, uh, and Java has been around since 1995. Uh, so, uh, Rust is a uh, relatively new language. 
So as things were going on in Mozilla.org, things were fine until uh, 220, Mozilla decided to lay off a bunch of people and that included lay off the Rust developers. And that unfortunate event resulted in 2021 uh, to, for folks to create a Rust foundation. And obviously part of it was that other companies had interest in making sure Rust continued and didn't die because Mozilla uh, decided to cancel the project. And therefore Rust Foundation, uh, you can, there's a link in here or you can Google it. Uh, quite a few big names joined and created the Ross Foundation. And probably the list of uh, five that I have listed in here, those were the initial, but there are not many more companies. And uh, where we are now, 22, 23, uh, it is a language that's in uh, uptrend uh, in a couple different ways. One is that more and more companies are using it to uh, write production quality code. And also uh, for whatever it's worth, take it with a grain of salt, uh, Rust is uh, based on um, you know, the feedback on Stack Overflow blogging. Uh, it's one of the most loved languages uh, for past six years. Uh, it has gotten that sort of uh, response. So. Um, so relatively young language, and uh, here's the history of it, and it seems that it is growing uh, in terms of companies using it as well as people learning it. So what is it that Rust is trying to do? Why is it something that people care about Rust? Uh, you know, there are many new languages, not many, there are still some new languages. Some of you might familiar, be familiar with Go, Julia, and who knows what else. Uh, so, you know, what is it that, you know, Rust brings to the table that's worth spending time uh, by the developers to learn something new? Uh, so, uh, basically, and these bullet points are everywhere in terms of what is listed in on the variety of websites, but the principles that uh, drove Rust and its success so far is it helps developers to develop bug-free and correct software. Now, it doesn't mean that by using Rust, everything is 100% free and so on, but it goes a long way comparing to C and C++ uh, to help you write better code and um, not have these code, not having any memory safety issues. And why is that important? Uh, many sources of uh, bugs that happen are basically things that are related to mishandling of memory. Uh, I might have a note uh, in one of the upcoming slides, but I mentioned here as well, uh, Microsoft and Google a few years back did an analysis of the bugs in their software products. And each one of them claims as they analyzed 70% of the bugs that they had reported and fixed in their code had to do with memory issues. So now I wasn't there obviously to make sure what I'm saying is the case, but that's what they believe. That if they had a language that would help to write a better uh, code that would prevent some of the memory safeties uh, at the compile time, then in the execution time, it would be a better uh, environment to run. So that was that. And 
as you will see through some code examples, a lot of these issues, including data races that could happen uh, due to threads accessing something, these are detected at the compile time. Doesn't You don't have to worry about it uh, because during the execution, because Rust, the way that it is, and by that I mean the fact that it's a statically typed language, you must declare every entity that you use in your program objects, and it's a very strict type checking that it does. It helps quite a bit during the compilation, take some of the issues that would end later on during the execution would uh, could cause you know all sorts of bugs. And it does all this uh, not at the cost of performance degra degradation during the execution. Some people might think, okay, it puts all the bells and whistles in there. So during the execution, these bad things do not happen. And therefore perhaps the execution time is, performance is, gets degraded. That's not the case. That's not the case at all because it catches all these, most of these things that it can during the compilation, not during the execution. And uh, the other thing is that uh, while languages like Java and C++ do garbage collection during the execution to get rid of unused memory, that is not necessarily a good thing if you have a real time system that cannot you know, get impacted because garbage collection under the hood comes alive and does work and still CPU cycles, Rust does not need any garbage collection. It doesn't have any. <laughs> and that's another beauty of the language. And because of all this, from security point of view, it's a safer language you would not have some of the bugs that uh, hackers used at taking advantage of code written in C that would uh, use buffer overflow uh, and put some bad nasty code uh, at the end of an array that is past this index or a buffer that you know C didn't check. And those things, uh, uh, Rust doesn't let you to get away with from, okay? And in terms of performance during the execution, uh, this website, uh, it's an independent website and they have been running different uh, performance measurement codes, quite a few set. Uh, on different languages, on different OSs uh, for God knows how many years. And you can go there and you can look at the numbers uh, so far as uh, Rust is concerned versus C, C++ and Golang. Uh, in, in terms of comparison, performance is very comparable to C, C++. And based on the performance numbers and the benchmarks is much better than Golang. Uh, for people who do not, might not know what Golang is, Golang is the language Go that uh, is a recent language, relatively young, that uh, was uh, designed at Google. And Again, it, it, it is something that uh, supposed to be uh, at the same level as C, C++ for systems programming with having objects and those things as well. So anyway, so uh, according to these benchmarks, performance is pretty good. And uh, the bonus or what I call bonus is the compiler is very fast. And not only that, the error diagnostics you get are wonderful. 
a lot of detail and after what it shows on the screen where the issues are with different colors for red being really a serious error and so on, then for some of this stuff, it at the end, it uh, tells you if you wanna find out more about this error, run the Rust compiler with dash dash the error number. And then you can run that later to find out more, much more. So that's good. Uh, like good languages, popular languages, there are growing number of Rust packages, libraries that people are writing left and right and sideways. So it's becoming a rich uh, you know, environment for programming and uh, basically reusing uh, libraries and packages rather than writing your own code. And it has a very active developer community. So uh, it's not a dead language. There is a lot of interest and a lot of code is being written. Now, where is it Rust being used for? For what kind of programming? Uh, as I said, uh, the frustration that Graydon had with C++, which is used for systems programming as well as other things led him to start playing with Rust. By the way, Graydon apparently is now works for Apple and he is a, supposedly the developer of Apple's programming language Swift, uh, which makes sense. This Graydon is, seems is into designing languages and compilers and all that. But anyway, where is Rust being used? Uh, as of end of last year now, uh, it is the only other language than C that now is allowed to be used to implement portions of the Linux kernel. That's a huge thing. Uh, for all these years uh, that Linux kernel was, uh, you know, has been around and being modified, the code was always in C. Now, it seems that uh, uh, Linus has decided that it's okay to write some of the functionality in uh, Rust. Also, in latest Android uh, operating system release from Google, claim is that 21% of the new code is in Rust. And until that, it has been C, C++. So it is, as you can see, these are two cases where very significant operating systems are being partially written in Rust. That's a lot to say for Rust, okay? Uh, in other types of programming, it seems that you can even do web development in Rust, but you gotta do it in the contents of uh, VASM or WebAssembly, uh, which is an interesting mechanism that's being used quite a bit to run things in web browsers. Uh, and it, it's not just for Rust, it's, it's a framework. And apparently game development is happening there. There is supposedly code written dealing with blockchain and who knows, who knows where it goes. Uh, the language is not just low level, uh, much like C++ and Java and Python, there's a notion of object oriented programming that you can do rather than just straight systems programming. And also uh, Rust in terms of some of its features, it has some features that come from functional programming languages. Uh, so even it seems folks, some folks are using it, using functional programming uh, paradigm, right? That object oriented programming paradigm and so on. So it's getting used. Now, this link uh, is from uh, source of truth, rust, dash lang.org and 
they keep track of who is using it and so on. And, and if you want to see which companies are using software written in Rust uh, in production, you might want to take a look at that. Okay, language features. Uh, by the way, source of truth, again, is that link that I, I mentioned in here, dub, 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 that dash lang.org. If you go there, anything and everything that you need to know about Ross language and this other sort of information is there. Source of truth is that. So obviously in this class, which is half an hour, we're not gonna cover all this stuff. That's not the, the, the essence of this class. It just gives you two flavors so you can compare it in terms of its features and other languages. So types, quite a few things that C, C++ has. It has a bunch of other things. It has the notion of tuple type that Python has. It has some interesting types like result and option type. And even though this is a statistic, statically type language, it even allows you to have dynamic binding if you have to. Now, why that? I don't know enough to tell you the rationale of allowing you to do binding. In terms of language construct, it has similar things. Uh, it, it, so what is listed in here is pretty much what you see in other languages as well. Uh, the, the new thing, or at least something that you can do a lot with, uh, is called lifetime specification that uh, is much more exhaustive than anywhere else I've seen. So uh, memory safety, as I said, one of the most important thing for using Rust is uh, providing you memory safe uh, programs. So uh, if we wanna know what memory safety means, uh, the whole page on Wiki tells you all sorts of exact details. But for the folks who are already programming, you understand what that means. And what I've listed in here are some of classic specific examples of memory safety. You have an uninitialized variable, or you free a variable and then you reference it, or there is a memory leak, and maybe you have already freed a memory associated with an object, and then you free it again. Uh, so these are the type of uh, what's called memory safety bugs. Now, just be clear, I'm not saying that Rust is curing all these. In fact, uh, while it is trying to help you catch your memory leaks during the compilation, it is possible to write Rust code that leaks memory. If you are uh, creating a list that is created recursively and you add to it, you add to it, you add element to it, similar to the notion of cons of Lisp language, uh, you know, you can create a list that goes forever and never stops and uh, consumes the memory. So just to make sure you understand, by using Rust, you cannot claim that Rust uh, uh, prevents 100% memory leak, but it does a pretty good job of things that other languages do not do. Now, how, when and how does, does help you with all this? When is as soon as possible to tell you, hey, this is wrong, don't go there, don't do it. And that's during compilation. Can't get any sooner than that. How does it do it? The foundation is that the fact is that language is statically typed. You must define type of anything and everything you use and does a very strong type checking during the compilation. And those two are foundations of how it can catch these things. And also there, is, there are new notions, what's called ownership, borrowing, and lifetimes that compiler uses to make sure it catches things that might cause problems. So we are gonna go through a very simple 
sample code just to give you a flavor of comparing the C code versus how uh, Rust handles it. This just gives you a very basic flavor of what the compiler does. On the left-hand side, uh, it's very simple uh, C code. There's a loop that goes through and tries to multiply numbers one through five and print the product. As you can see, we never initialized variable prod to one. C compiles it and lets you run it. Whereas in on the right hand side, this is a piece of real Rust code. When you do this, it tells you. It tells you exactly like what I put in here. Tells you where the problem is and says, you know, this is uninitialized. And boom, such a simple thing uh, helps have better code. Uh, bound checking, array bound checking. And this is really important because again, this was the foundation of what was called buffer overflow uh, that uh, some folks used to inject bad code. So on the left-hand side, we have an array, static array, and it has it's been initialized to five values. So the size of the array is five elements. So it doesn't make sense to refer to the seventh element. There is no such thing. You're pointing to some memory location past the five memory storage that is array. But some, uh, compiled in C, no complaints. In uh, Rust, it catches it. And the error message that you see is exactly what you get. Tells you, hey, this is wrong. Here is a case of simple, but just to get you the point that this is one way that Rust prevents is memory leaks. Uh, on the left-hand side, I have a, a C function that allocates dynamic memory, malloc, uh, from the heap, not from the stack, and you get a pointer back to that location in the memory, in the heap. And then you can do things to it, put a value in it and do other things with it. And in here, you have allocated memory. This is a very small size, size of an integer, uh, you know, not a big deal, but coming out of this function, that memory that you were referring to it by this local variable is left there. It's leaked. Outside of here, you cannot access it because this was through this local variable that you defined here. So this is a memory leak. You did not free the memory in here as you should at, at the end of your function uh, f. In Oops, in Rust, Rust knows as obviously as it's compiling that this is a local variable. And when it knows that that variable is gonna go out of scope, it automatically adds equivalent of, it adds this call drop, which is equivalent to C's uh, free function call that's supposed to use free the memory. So it does this for you. As soon as you, you know, execution gets out of uh, function F because during the compilation, put the code in there says, okay, this is a local, it's gonna go out of scope. I'm just gonna freeze memory. Here is another example of uh, what uh, we would call a dangling reference. And in here, on the left-hand side, uh, um, I have in the main code, uh, this pointer to a character, which is equivalent of you're gonna point somewhere in the memory to access some string or do some stringy thing to it. So here, S, 
is a pointer points to a copy of this string testing somewhere in the memory. And then you come along and you free what S was pointing at. And after that, you should not use S. S is supposed to be gone. You cannot count on it pointing to a valid memory location. Yet, if you access it in here, no complaint. It compiles happily. Whereas in Python, you will get this. The, the, the error message might be cryptic for you. It says value borrowed here after move. What the heck does that mean? And uh, two things. One is that if you compile this, you will get some other informative messages that I just couldn't put here because this is one slide that do not have a lot of real estate. And the notion of borrowing would make sense to you once you know about lifetime and borrowing. Here is another example of what compiler helps you. On the left-hand side, the C program, you have an unsigned 8-bit integer and you initialize it to 200. And then if you do something like this, this, it goes beyond the representation of n, which can have only up to and including value 256. So in here, Ross catches this and he says, hey, you are typecasting this with this and the way that it does its typecasting, it doesn't. I mean, in here you typecast things and all is well. Uh, this gets typecasted and this is okay, but in here it doesn't let you even go there the way that uh, it, it requires explicit typecasting. It says, no, you cannot do this uh, because it takes this 71 and typecasts it to unsigned eight and n is unsigned eight. And because of n being an unsigned eight bit, 71 is turned into unsigned eight bit. Therefore it says, oops, this can't happen. You cannot have value 271 as an unsigned eight bit value. So it doesn't do these things. Uh, it expects you to do explicit typecasting and things like that at times might cause issues. And this is, while not a big deal, it might not happen in, in a lot of code. Here is on, on, on this side, we have a piece of C code. And the, after the return statement in, in here, I have a call to function too. As you know, in any language, once you hit the return statement, you get out, you go out to the caller. So this function two is never reached. This call is never made. Compiler, Ross tells you, it says, hey, watch out. It, this, this is never, ever gonna get executed. Okay, so in uh, <clears throat> Ross, there's a notion of lifetime. And this one line is from source of truth. And every reference to any object has a lifetime. And the lifetime is the scope uh, in which that object is valid. You can access it, reference it, as so long as you're in that scope. And um, some of the implicit or inferred lifetimes exist in other languages. The thing about Rust is that it allows you explicitly define lifetimes as you see fit to make sure that you know what should be available. Uh, and no doubt that it's not after that scope and so on. So basically with lifetime, you tag, and I'll show you an example of how I tag, and you use this tag to define the scope of the lifetime. And if you put it in the right places, then you are giving hints to Rust that, hey, 
this is the lifetime of all these variables that I've tagged within this time frame. Keep them around, make sure they get what they, they need to do. And, uh, you know, once they're out of that lifetime, the color of the code, then they cannot access anything. You would not have any issues of uh, uh, having that memory that stays there without even being used and so on. Now, lifetimes, you already know. When you get into a function call or a procedure call, uh, things that local variables and so on that get into the stack portion of a, a function call frame, as soon as you're done with the execution of function, those things go away. So this is you know, implicit. You don't have to declare it. That's how other languages work. And as I said, in Rust, all that is doable, but you can also explicitly define the lifetime as you see fit as well. Now, will this uh, memory safe ownership uh, and lifetime uh, and borrowing, all these go together. So uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit through different next few slides, but bear with me. Now, as I said, uh, you define the lifetime and in any given lifetime, the piece of code, uh, a piece of code owns those entities that are relevant and owned by that piece of code to control and manage and own the lifetime of those entities. And that way, once the execution of the code is out of that piece of code, then Rust deallocates everything clean under the hood. So you don't have to worry about any memory safety of that issue. Uh, to get to the point of what, what lifetime is, and it's a little bit subtle uh, concept. So uh, bear with me. So here, this is Rust code now we are talking about on the left-hand side. We have a structure representing a coordinates of a point uh, in two dimensional space, X and Y. X is uh, integer 32 bit, Y is a Y coordinate 32 bit. And in here, uh, we have a function print coordinates and you pass to it an object of type coordinate and it prints the X and Y coordinates. And then here's our main program and main program has a object or a variable local to main, and it is of type coordinates and gets initialized to x equal to six and y equal three. At this point, because of this statement being done, entity p comes to life inside the function main, that means main owns P because that's where it came to life. So main is responsible under the hood to own and manage everything of uh, this variable P. So let's continue and you see what that means, what that or what the implications are. So then we call print coordinate and we pass P to print coordinate and to print it, let's say. And then we come out and for some reason, let's say within main, we print the X coordinate here as well. Now, if you try to compile this, it would not compile. And here's what the compiler tells you on the right-hand side. And all these useful uh, messages are with what another example of how good error messages are in, in Python, but uh, it might be a little bit cryptic to you that says this value borrowed here after move. What the heck does that mean? Here's what happens. So P is owned by main. If I pass P into another function, then 
in effect, I'm giving the ownership of P to this other function. Therefore, if I do that by design, and then I come out and then try to access the, the P that I had here that I gave the ownership to this, Rust will wonder what happens if pin coordinate changes something of P under the hood and causes trouble. Maybe coordinate P would do something there. Therefore, at that point, since P is passed to print coordinate, P is now owned by print coordinate. Therefore, any other function, including main that we are here and we call print line, then in effect, we are saying, hey, we are borrowing X portion of P because now P is owned by print coordinate, not main anymore. The ownership is in print coordinate. Therefore, by referencing P dot X in the main, we are saying that we are gonna borrow it. Well, as I said, depending on what print coordinate does to P, we are in trouble. Maybe something nasty happens that when we try to do something with it in the main program, it co could cause problems. And therefore Python doesn't let, I said Python, Rums doesn't let you do this. And that's what it says, hey, this reference, you are borrowing something that's owned elsewhere and that thing that's owned elsewhere is P, which we gave its ownership by passing it directly to this call and therefore print coordinate owns P. So one question is, okay, how can I get around this? Yes, there's, there's at least one way to get around it in the right way. But this is a strictly type checking and make sure that something that is owned by a piece of code <clears throat> is truly maintained and monitored by that piece of code. And once you're outside of it, it doesn't let you to do things that could cause problems. So in general, ownership, just to summarize it, it what happens, it only allows a single binding of especially any heap allocated memory at the same time. Memory de deallocations happens, all good, because it knows where the, how much the lifetime is. And also the fact that it knows that how, how long something is alive and it's gone, it doesn't let somebody to uh, take something that's already deallocated and do things with it. Now, having said all these things where there's a single owner for any object, a single owner being a single piece of code owning an object, it is possible to have multiple owners. That is doable, but you have to use certain type of pointers called reference counting pointers. It, otherwise it wouldn't let you. So if there are cases like that, you have to use this construct. Now, Back to our coordinate program, the way that we passed entity P to print coordinate, print coordinate became the owner of P, but that caused us trouble in main because we couldn't do a P.X. How do you prevent this happening? What you do is instead of passing the object P itself, which is whatever it is, we pass ampersand P. Now, be careful, uh, C, C++, and possibly Java programmers. Uh, ampersand P looks like passing or call by reference, if you know what I mean. That's not quite that. What it is, is in Rust, it takes address of this object P. 
puts the address in some other location and passes that location to print coordinate. Why that is important? Because in other languages, when you pass a reference to an object, you are allowed and you can easily change the value of whatever that P is pointing at because reference means address. In Rust, that's not what it means. It just takes the address of that object, puts it in another memory location and passes that memory location uh, to Rust. So if you coming from those languages, that means you can modify things inside P, no, by passing a reference. The only thing that it does when you pass a reference from here to somewhere else, that means that it tells Rust, hey, you still maintain the ownership of P. If you pass a reference to an object, main still owns P. Therefore, still owner, and this passing just a reference guarantees that print coordinate does not own it, cannot mess around with it. So once you're back in here, you are safe and sound that p.x is good. Now, as I mentioned in uh, Rust, you can uh, explicitly uh, define lifetime of some objects. And that is something that you can do in other languages. So uh, let's look at this Rust code on the left. Uh, I have in the main uh, two strings, phi and pi, and I'm calling shorter to tell me which one is the shorter of the other, something simple. And here is my shorter Rust function, uh, S1, first parameter type string, that and in uh, Rust, this is the this is the syntax that you specify what type of value is returned as a result of the function call. So you have this looks easy, nothing, but here is uh, Rust's problem with this piece of code. This local variable, shorter string. The way that this is written, depending on whether you go through the then part or the else part, it gets a value of S1 or S2, right? Now, sitting within here, you do not have any clue what the scope of the arguments, actual parameters that are represented by S1 and S2 are. Therefore, how does it, Python needs to know what the scope of this thing is to make sure it's a kosher valid scope? Should it be the scope of S1? Should it be the scope of S2? And this main program doesn't show the justice because both string one and string two are in the same scope. But you can imagine a, a, a function like this could be called in any parts of different programs with different variables, where they are coming from, who knows what the scope of those things are. So it needs to make sure that it knows what, the, uh, what should be the scope of, the good scope for uh, making sure short string has the right scope and all works well. And here is the definition of how you define the scope using a tag. In here, I'm saying, first of all, this, this pink thing, thing is the syntax. I'm defining a scope, ugly looking syntax, but what can I say? And in this syntax, the name of the tag for the scope is A. So I'm saying the scope of anything in this function is this and use that as the same scope for this and this and this, and this is what returns. So this guarantees that you know, from compiler point of view, everything is tight. We know what the scopes are. And depending on who calls us, we don't shoot ourselves in the foot. Now, the good, the bad, and the ugly is a matter of your opinion. 
uh, but the good is a safer language, compiles fast, good diagnostics, good runtime performance. You can call C or C++ libraries from, or code from uh, Rust, but you gotta be careful. Those languages are not safe. So when you go through what's called FEI, foreign, I forgot the E, interface, foreign environment interface, calling these things, it tells you this is unsafe. Doesn't know what's happening there, but it allows you to call. And it's usable for all sorts of paradigms of programming. Okay, uh, the bad. Well, it's, it's hard to learn. And that causes frustration. <laughs> because things that work and is written with less syntax and coding in these other languages, you try to do the same and it doesn't work. Or doesn't compile, I should say. And the semicolon um, in this language, for most part, it, it works what you think it works, but there's a flavor of use of semicolon that you are allowed not to have your statement followed by semicolon, but what happens, the effect of that is that that statement becomes an expression and that expression is uh, returned um, as a call of your function call. Let me see if I have, no, I, I, in here I, I do a return. Let's say I didn't have this return statement. If I did not have the return statement, and if I didn't put the semicolons in here, then it would return either this or this or this. If you didn't have semicolon, it says, okay, I'm gonna return one, you know, which one I'm going to. But anyway, so this is something to be careful of. Uh, not a big deal, but it's important. Now, I don't know what else is bad. You can ask different people, you get different lists. Uh, the ugly, uh, there's a steep learning curve. <laughs> if you are going from C to C++, not bad. C++ to Java, still tolerable, uh, but that's not quite the same. It has some new features that you gotta get used to. It's a rather verbose language, even for if statements where you have single statements in that if part, then part, else part, you must still use brackets. Uh, there's some strange looking syntax. And as I said, naming mic micros, uh, uh, naming um, tags for uh, lifetime, it's weird looking. And also macros, here is print ln, bang. Anything that ends in bang as, is not a function, it's a macro. I don't know why they had to do this. And the other thing is uh, print line looks like a statement print line from Pascal, which literally had print ln. Yet the syntax of this thing is borrowed from Python. So, hmm. What can I say? And there are other things. Uh, there are two types when you deal with strings. One as I've done in here and another one is in here. So there are these things that you're not used to and it's gonna be a little bit of indigestion. And finally, this one last thing that I don't like but there's a valid explanation for it. Take a look at this function. Uh, this statement inside F1, we are defining a local uh, object or variable, and we haven't talked about box type and all that, but effectively this is equivalent of a malloc that you do in C, C++. So in those languages, the way that the syntax is, you get a pointer back. You put a star in front of it because malloc returns to a pointer that whenever you use 
you want to do something with that location that that pointer points to, you use star and the name of your pointer to dereference and access those. Okay, so this is Rust. And I do something very simple. I have this variable, and again, right hand side is equivalent of a malloc. It goes and locates some someplace in the heap, and we pass to it this value formal parameter n, which is an integer. So it reserves some place, puts that value in there at the execution time. So simply one way to look at it, if you compare it to malloc, say, so, oh, okay, this is a pointer. But look what happens here. I print in P and star in P. And I get the same value. This is strange. If you're coming from pointer type languages and, you know, Rust has three different types of pointers. So pointers are used, but coming from C, C++, this looks strange. How come in P, when I print it, it gives me 314 because I called it with 314 and star in P, which is supposed to dereference, gives me the same value. And here's why. When you do this in P, by the way, both of these in this context of accessing and printing is allowed and it's legal, nothing wrong with it. And here's the explanation. In P is one way to look at it is there is some place in the memory and in P is the name of that place. If you look at it that way, well, in P is the name of a variable, much like any other variable not necessarily malloc variable. Therefore, when you reference, reference it like that, it's 314, like a normal variable. At the same time, we know under the hood, this is in reality, a pointer to a location in the memory. And if you look at it that way, this is valid, the referencing the pointer, which goes to the location where 314 Yes, therefore both of it are valid. And to me, this is ugly when you're coming from one language, but there is an explanation for it. And it's not a compiler bug. Okay, I think we're at seven o'clock. I believe that's the last slide uh, of the deck, I think. And let me see what else we have. And there's a plug in here, thanks to the, thanks to the marketing. Um, just telling you that I teach Python for programmers and I'm teaching it now and sp spring session starts on April the 11th. And I thank you for your time. Hope your the dinner didn't get cold or hope your wife didn't yell at you taking this class and not taking care of the kids. Hi, we have one question in the chat. Can we take that before we sign off? Let me see what we have. Which one? I'm sorry, in the Q&A from Ian. Ian, I just started learning Golang. Well, uh, again, uh, Ian, if you look at that link uh, where, or you can Google and find others, that place performance is much better than Golang from what they have listed, uh, which is significant, that is. Now, um, I am not a Go person in the sense uh, I, I do not know enough to, to judge. Uh, it has its merits. No language is perfect. So uh, you got to pick and choose. And uh, all I can say, uh, uh, it seems that, and again, you probably would be a better judge to say how good of a strict type checking Golang does versus uh, um, uh, Rust. Uh, as a point of reference also, uh, uh, National Security Agency uh, a few months ago published some document. And in that uh, they, they are encouraging or recommending software programmers to stay away from C, C++ because of some of the issues we just talked about. And they are recommending higher 
static type languages ranging from C sharp, Ruby, well, C sharp is Windows specific, so let's put that aside. Ruby, Java, and uh, you know, our languages that are statically typed. So from that point of view, maybe Go is good as good as uh, Rust. But I cannot really comment on that one. But I, based on what I read, it seems the performance is significant difference. And Dinesh, it looks like that was actually a two-part question. Do you see the first part about ownership in Rust? So when P is borrowed, lent to a second function. Oh, I see. It wouldn't even let you. Uh, I, I, no, I, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay, I make, make sure you understand. So we pass the ownership to a second function. In there, what you have stated is correct. When you pass something by reference in other languages, you can change because it's a reference. It's a pointer to where the original function corresponding object is. In languages such as C, C++, in Rust, no. That ampersand that you put there is purely a notion that says, hey, this call function is borrowing this variable from me, not, I'm not transferring the ownership. So correct, you cannot change it as is. Having said that, if you really wanted to change something like this within that second function, you need to make two changes to let the compiler allow you to do that. One, you make the original object, the one that you are letting to be borrowed, you declare it as to be of the mutable type by putting the word MUT when you de declare that variable. Two, in the function header of function two, again, you use the MUT reserve word for the formal parameter that say, hey, this is mutable also. So you have to do those two things if you really wanted to change it, but your assessment is correct. You cannot change what is being uh, passed to somebody else from within that function. Thanks, Nash. Uh, sure. Bob has a question. How does Ross handle libraries? It allows you to have libraries. It has a standard library uh, like any other language. And uh, also, as I said, it allows you to link in uh, libraries from C, C++, and libraries or modules written by the third uh, uh, parties. It has all that. Great, thank you. Uh, David, great question. Uh, yeah, the certificate program in computer programming uh, has a, a ton of fundamental classes. So if you want to study C, Java, uh, C++, Python, um, if you want to get a good fundamental understanding of programming in various languages, or if you want to focus on one, uh, for example, you could take Python all the way from beginners through intermediate into uh, advanced and data structures. Uh, so yeah, it's a great program to learn the fundamentals and even specify or specialize in a particular language if you want to. Uh, Jim, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A, do you? Okay. All right, Tanesh, any final words before we sign off? Uh, I hope this was uh, worth your time and uh, good luck uh, if you decide to go with Rust or otherwise. And thank you for attending. Yes, we want to thank you all for being here. We did run a little over, so we apologize, but we did have a lot we were eager to share. Um, just a final reminder, this is being recorded, so we'll have this recording um, polished up and ready for you in the next few days. And we'll be sure to include some extra links to what you saw tonight. Um, as well as contact information if you have any follow-up questions. So thank you for being here. Take care. Good night.